It's Thursday, October 6th, and this is now on HNN. <laughs> Tragedy in Thailand. Dozens of children are killed in a massacre at a child care center. The suspect on the run is a former police officer. So it's all sides kind of poking each other. As tensions with North Korea escalate, we'll speak to a national security expert about the latest developments. The USGS is now providing daily updates on Mauna Loa as the volcano shows signs of elevated unrest. These stories plus the Ironman World Championships is underway in Kona with the women hitting the course. Details coming up on This Is Now. We want to get started with this breaking news from Las Vegas. Police there are investigating a reported stabbing on the Las Vegas Strip that has left two people dead. As of now, we know there were eight people stabbed and there has been one suspect reported of the victims. Two people have died and three are in critical condition. Police say the remaining victims are said to be in stable condition. The weapon that was recovered at the scene is said to be a large kitchen knife. We're told this all happened on the Las Vegas Strip, like I said, near the Wynn Las Vegas Casino. Everyone who's been to Las Vegas is familiar with that. I do see a reporter talking right now live from our Vegas affiliate. I want to listen in a little bit to what he's saying. From basically the entrance of the wind all the way down to the Palazzo area, but at least from this side, not much was changing. Actually, uh, moments ago, you missed it. There were groups, hordes of people even, who were standing by watching this, trying to figure out exactly what happened as well, but then right after just seemed to head back into the, the mall. Again, that's our reporter talking from our Las Vegas affiliate there. Also, I can tell you right now, we are being told by our sister station that they were told by bystanders that the victims appeared to be showgirls taking pictures with tourists. Of course, this is all still developing very much as we're on the air. If we get any updates during This Is Now, we'll be sure to pass that along to you. Now to a tragedy in Thailand, 36 people are dead, dozens of them children, after a deadly rampage at a preschool by a former police officer. Kelly Kobiea has the latest. Well, police in Thailand say 22 of the victims were children at a daycare about 300 miles north of Bangkok. They were killed along with two teachers and a police officer. All of this happened around lunchtime. It was nap time at that daycare when police say the gunman entered, fired at staff. They say he was agitated because his own child wasn't at the daycare. They say he then shot his way through a locked door and continued the rampage inside one room where children were sleeping. Uh, they say that most of the children killed at the daycare were stabbed, not shot. Police say he then got into his own car. They say once he arrived at his home, he killed his wife and child before turning the gun on himself. Police are not talking about a motive as yet, but they do say that this former police officer was fired from the force last year because of an alleged drug offense, and they say he was in court on that drugs charge earlier today. Mass killings in Thailand are not common at all. The last one was two years ago in 2020 when a soldier opened fire, went on a shooting spree at a mall and around outside a mall, a, a siege that lasted 16 hours. But the country does have some of the highest rates of gun ownership and gun homicide in Asia. Kelly Kobiea, NBC News, London. All right, joining us now is Chris Keel with Armada Corporate Intelligence, the managing director there. All sorts of insight on international happenings in the world of defense. Chris, I wanted to bring you on This Is Now today to talk about North Korea and the tensions there, something of always of importance here in the Asia Pacific. The latest news being yet another missile uh, launch. What is yeah. happening there? What's been going on? Yeah, what you're seeing is kind of an exchange of flexing. Uh, the U.S. has been active with South Korea in some joint military exercises. The Ronald Reagan is in the area. Now the aircraft carrier, you have battle groups that are sailing into areas that are international, but North Korea has always considered them sensitive. 
So they're launching missiles over Japan for the first time in five years. They're also launching some other strikes that are near but not actually in the uh, territorial waters of Japan. So it's all sides kind of poking each other, saying, look, I can do this if I want to. And it's like, well, I don't want you to. Well, I don't care that you don't want to. Um, so it isn't really in a escalating frame at this point. You're not seeing either side trying to push it to a more dangerous level. But it's it's kind of warning each other that don't take this any further than you already have. And North Korea is also kind of reacting to what China has been doing lately. Uh, China is trying to flex its muscles when it comes to things like the South China Sea and Taiwan, even the Senkaku, Daiyu Islands. So it's it's kind of connected to that whole dance to say who has control here uh how serious is the united states how serious are they as far as supporting south korea and one of the launches this week is believed to have flown over part of japan i believe mm -hmm. and anytime we're talking missiles and missile scares it's really hits home here in hawaii with our false missile scare that happened right. a few years back what is japan saying about all this yeah, Japan is not happy. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida has made it very clear that this is unacceptable. Japan has been getting a lot more aggressive in terms of its rhetoric in the last year or so. It's much more nationalistic than it has been in previous years and has been very upfront about its commitment to Taiwan, which has been a bit of a provocation to China. North Korea frequently ends up acting kind of like a a, a support or a peasant to the Chinese foreign policy. So it's, it's a, again, an exchange of warnings. The Japanese are a lot less patient with these kinds of demonstrations than they've been in the past. Not clear what they would actually do about it at this stage, but their response was to go on alert, uh, to put the country on what amounts to a, a defensive posture and a warning that if this was to happen again, or if it was to get even more provocative, that Japan would respond in kind. Not that they have necessarily the same sort of ballistic missile capability, but as Kishida has pointed out, Japan does have missile capacity. They put satellites in orbit all the time, and turning those into a more military response would not be that difficult. All right, Chris, that's all the time we got today, but I thank you for being with us here on This Is Now, and I'm sure we'll be checking back in with you and your expertise very soon. Very good. Thank you. Now, those high gas prices we've been seeing have been dropping, but that soon may change due to a drastic cut in global oil production. For more on that, we're joined by Chris Wynn, who's from our nation's capital. Chris. Hey, Ashley, with just one month to go until the midterms, you probably noticed that gas prices are starting to creep up once again, and that's posing a major political problem that the White House has been desperately trying to avoid. Less supply of crude oil equals less supply of gasoline. Less supply of gasoline at current demand levels equals higher prices. Oil experts are warning the price of gas is about to surge after OPEC plus oil ministers agreed to cut production by 2 million barrels per day. We are not endangering the energy markets. We are providing security, stability to the energy markets. At a price. Uh, everything has a price. Energy security has a price as well. The decision is a major loss for the Biden administration, which had launched a full-scale pressure campaign in a last-ditch effort to dissuade Middle Eastern allies from cutting production, according to multiple sources. What's your reaction to the OPEC funds? Disappointment, and uh, we're looking at what alternatives we may have. Now, five weeks before a high-stakes midterm election, the Biden administration is frantically sifting through options to keep gas prices down. We believe we have the tools here at home uh, to work with our allies and to work with Congress to make sure that we address the mistake that OPEC made yesterday, which was the wrong direction. And again, I believe it will have less of an impact in the United States and far more of an impact on lower income countries uh, around the world. There's a lot of alternatives we haven't made up our mind yet. 
Actually, the White House has been silent on what those alternatives could be. As you know, the administration has been dipping into the nation's strategic petroleum reserve in an effort to keep gas prices down, but that's all scheduled to end on November 1st. In the D.C. newsroom, I'm Chris Wynn, Hawaii News Now. Ashley? Now, Chris, beyond raising gas prices, these cuts by the Middle Eastern oil states could do even more damage. Can you tell us more about that? That's right, Ashley. It's concerning because rising oil prices could mean that inflation stays higher for longer, which could then add pressure to the Federal Reserve to hike up interest rates more aggressively. So there's a lot to unpack here, and it'll be interesting to see how this all impacts our wallet at the end of the day. Ashley? Absolutely. Chris Wynn joining us from Washington, D.C. We appreciate the time. Police telling us today 43-year-old Weldon Manuel has been arrested in connection with a deadly stabbing. It happened near Kaimuki High School yesterday. Police found a man stabbed in the chest along Kapiolani Boulevard. Authorities say he was rushed to the hospital but passed away. Police say the suspect was arrested at the scene and that he knew the victim. We've also learned today that a man has been arrested in connection with a separate stabbing in Nana Cooley. Police say 33-year-old Samuel Fiera is in custody, suspected of attempted murder and abuse of a family member. He allegedly got into an argument with a 26-year-old woman and stabbed her in the back with a knife. She was last reported to be in serious condition. New details in a violent home invasion in Aina Haina. Police say a woman was watering her plants when a male suspect pushed her to the ground and held her at gunpoint. A second male suspect ran inside and attacked another woman in her bedroom, demanding money. This all happened at around 6.30 last night in a home on the Malka side of Kalani Anaole Highway in the Paiko Lagoon area. Emergency Medical Services tells us a 25-year-old woman suffered serious injuries to her face but refused to be taken to the hospital. A woman in her 60s suffered minor injuries. Sources tell us the attackers fled in a white BMW and at last report, they were still on the run. The Honolulu Police Commission has decided taxpayers will fund the defense of two HPD officers accused of chasing a car that crashed and then failing to render aid. The officers remain on restricted duty as the city prosecutor's office investigates the allegations that the two did not stop to help the victims who were teens and adults who were seriously injured. The victims in the September 2021 crash are now suing the officers and the city. The commissioners voted yesterday with four approving the request for taxpayer-funded attorneys. The other three voted against it. A death investigation in Kaimuki required a hazardous materials crew because of what officers found in the home. Allison Blair has the story. The Honolulu Fire Hazmat Unit responded to a home on Pahoa Avenue after sources say a powdery substance was found as officers were investigating the death of a 28-year-old man. The standard protocol for our companies, if they know it's a hazardous materials environment, they dispatch hazmat right away. Firefighter Union President Bobby Lee. They carry uh, much more uh, equipment and testing equipment than the regular companies. Sources confirm a field test conducted at the scene of Tuesday night's death investigation in Kaimuki came back positive for fentanyl. HFD officials say hazmat crews perform such tests using a handheld mass spectrometer like this one. The device can identify unknown compounds, adding firefighters wear personal protective clothing when they respond to any medical call. Meanwhile, fentanyl overdoses are on the rise across the state. Late last month, Hawaii's Federal Drug Task Force put out this warning about an extremely potent batch of the drug that had been smuggled onto Hawaii Island. Big Island police say in a matter of one week, it's believed to have killed three people and triggered several more overdoses. And to make it even more appealing, it's manufactured in colorful forms to appeal to the youth, like candy. Officers on Hawaii Island recently confiscated these colorful fentanyl lace pills, some even packaged in Santa Claus baggies. As the drug becomes more prevalent in the community, officials say parents need to talk to their kids, adding every family should consider having Narcan in their medicine cabinet.
it revives the person who overdosed on the opioid. HFD says the department aims to have Narcan on all of its trucks next month. Meanwhile, crews on Maui and the Big Island are already equipped with the antidote. In Honolulu, Allison Blair, Hawaii News Now. Now to the Big Island, Mauna Loa Volcano is being closely monitored. Elevated seismic activity prompted the closure of the Mauna Loa Summit backcountry until further notice as a precaution, and the Hawaiian Volcano Observed Observatory says the volcano is not erupting and there are no signs of an imminent eruption at this time. However, Mauna Loa is currently experiencing heightened unrest. Now, what exactly does that mean? Here's the scientist in charge at HVO. Well, the the difficulty with Mauna Loa is it can really ramp up to an eruption very, very quickly. It can actually start activity and within a few hours be erupting. So typically it's kind of got what we would call a short fuse that when it really ramps up and we know for sure it's going to erupt, we can't give a very big warning on that. So it's probably at most going to be a couple of days, but it could be just a few hours when it starts to ramp up. So that's why right now is a great time to prepare to make sure that you do have all your important things together. All right, that was a scientist in charge there speaking to us last night about those latest developments. I also wanted to show you this graph from the USGS website. So we are at advisory level there on the ground and yellow for aviation. So the next level would be a watch for the ground alerts from the USGS as far as volcano alerts go and orange for aviation and warning. That's what we really, really need to be aware of. Warning for ground level alerts, red for aviation. That's when you really, really need to pay attention. So to pay attention, the USGS is sending out these daily alerts now, and we're going to be monitoring them very closely. You can too as well. If you want to sign up to get these alerts or just look at them, just head to our homepage. We have a story written up about this latest advisory from the USGS. You can just click on a link there and it take you right to it. Also, you can get to resources like this web camera we were showing you a bit ago. This was taken earlier this morning, but they have a number of live cameras to monitor as well as well as instrument graphs from their tilt meters there on the summit that measure how the ground is really moving. You can look at those graphs as well. So we'll be tracking that all day long here at HNN as well. But for now, I want to take you live outside to our nation's capital. Wow. And look what's happening. The days are getting shorter there on the East Coast. And it's looking golden and gorgeous mm -hmm. there for fall. Pretty soon, those leaves are going to match, hopefully, if those autumnal co colors come out for the fall. Let's turn it over now to our own Guy Hoggy with a look at our weather. And we're tracking the rain that we're expecting over the next several days. Because we got light winds, we're expecting fairly dry skies, uh, dry conditions in the morning, and then clouds will build up in the afternoon. We'll have some spotty downpours, especially for like the corner side of the Big Island. So that's going to be the weather trend uh, every day for the next several days. Looks like Saturday in the afternoon, we'll have some, sh some showers across the state, drier again Sunday morning, wet again Sunday evening, and then dry again Monday morning. But through the day Monday, look for more widespread showers. Monday Monday is expected to be the day with the most rainfall and with those light winds taking over by tomorrow and we're in for a long run of humid conditions. So again, we'll see mostly afternoon showers for interior and leeward spots, but because there's going to be a lot of moisture around, even uh, you know some windward sides might pick up. And again, Monday's the day when we expect more, mostly cloudy skies with scattered showers. Thanks, Guy. Check out what's happening on those feeds and what cyberspace is talking about today on this Almost Friday. One thing's coming to us from social media giant Twitter. Some changes there. Check this out. Users will now be able to get more information out per tweet. That's been a long time complaint there at Twitter. The social media giant is unveiling a new feature that allows users to combine text, GIFs, photos, videos, and single tweet. Prior to this, only one type of media could be used per tweet. But now, up to four forms can be sent. Is that too much? Is that Sounds just me? Sounds like yeah. it's too much. These kids these days. These days. <laughs> <laughs> to get access to these new multimedia posts, Twitter users have to click on the photo icon 
and the composer and add whichever forms they want to use. I'm not a big Twitter Same. user, so I need a primer. Please help me. <laughs> There's some young kids in the newsroom that can help me out. Yeah. Well, it's fall, so that means pumpkin everything, right? So the national record for the largest pumpkin was set in New York over the weekend. Look at that thing. It weighed in at 2,554 pounds and broke the national record for pumpkin weight by 26 pounds. It did fall short of the Guinness World Record of 2,702 pounds. This pumpkin will be on display at the Great Pumpkin Farm in Clarence, New York until October 16th. The Great Pumpkin Farm. I know. Right? Then what happens to it after yeah. October 16th? Lots of pumpkin pie. <laughs> yum, yum, yum for Thanksgiving. Look how happy that guy is about his big pumpkin. All right. Let's get to some good news, some entertainment news. And this looks cool. So we got Margot Robbie, Christian Bale all teaming up for a new star cast in this flick called Amsterdam in theaters on Friday. Let's turn it over to our good friend Michelle Turner over at Entertainment Tonight with more on that. Aloha, Jonathan. Amsterdam is a quirky buddy comedy slash murder mystery full of crazy characters. And that's what attracted Margot to the role. Your character is yes. being described as brilliant yet nuts. And I'm kind of sensing a theme. We're bad guys. It's what we do. I guess I like playing these characters that are very, like, just kind of walk to the beat of their own drum, yeah. you know? It's we kind of liberating to get to do that at work. I, I feel like my acting is only ever as good as the people I'm acting with, and yeah. I couldn't be in better company in this movie, so oh, very lucky. <laughs> The company in Amsterdam includes Robert De Niro, Rami Malek, and Mike Myers. Margot, John, David Washington, and Christian Bale play three best friends accused of murder. This is all turning out to be a lot larger than any of us. Mr. De Niro, Chris Rock, to share the screen with them was just inspiring. I'll never forget it. This is De Niro's fourth film with director David O. Russell. He's just got a very unusual special style of filmmaking, so I always want to be part of it when I can. And get this, Drake executive produced the film and Taylor Swift has a cameo. I, I, I'm blessed to have met Taylor. She's a very available, real person. And we had a very good connection. And she, want, she was fun. She wanted to have fun and come and be part of this. And tune into ET tonight for our Tori Spelling exclusive, why she's talking family, love, and lies. For Entertainment Tonight, I'm Michelle Turner. That's on KGMB after a 6 o'clock newscast. Tori Spelling's been a guest here on This Is Now as well. Sure All has. right. Let's see what else is going in the world of good news. Petting a dog is actually good for our brains. Hey, that's good to know. <laughs> it's a new study. Researchers put brain scanners on people and gave them a pet and then a stuffed animal alongside that live one. So they had two different sample groups uh -huh. going, a pet, a real live one, and a stuffed animal one. And there was a big boost in brain, brain activity when a person got to pet the real life pup, specifically the frontal cortex. And that part of the brain that handles how we think and feel. So very cool. Who Yay. sort of knew that already, right? Yeah. Well, let's get a check on the Ironman competition that's underway on the Big Island. And the women's race going on right now, Daniel Wright from Switzerland is in the lead by a narrow margin. They are currently on the bike portion of the race now. How long is an Ironman triathlon? Well, there's a 2.4 mile swim, a 112 mile bike ride, and then, of course, that full marathon, the 26.2 mile run. That's going to do it for This Is Now on this almost Friday. We're almost there, guys. Ash is back later this evening on later editions of H&N. Watch for it then.